the epistle for this Mass of the wedding between uh, Wyatt Earp and Michelle Bulwer. The epistle is from St. Paul to the Catholics in Ephesus, chapter 5. Brethren, let wives be subject to their husbands as to the Lord, because a husband is head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church, being himself the Savior of the body. But just as the church is subject to Christ, so also let wives be to their husbands in all things. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and delivered himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, cleansing her in the bath of water by means of the word, in order that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she might be holy and without blemish. Even thus ought husbands also to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loveth himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh. On the contrary, he nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body, made from his flesh and from his bones. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, I mean, in reference to Christ and the church. However, let, what, let each one of you also love his wife, just as he loveth himself, and let the wife respect her husband. The Holy Gospel. From St. Matthew chapter 19. At that time the Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and saying, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause? But he answered and said to them, Have you not read that the Creator from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore now they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. The flowers have appeared in our land. The time of pruning has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come. My dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hollow places of the wall. Show thy face to me, let your voice sound in my ears, for thy voice is sweet and your face is beautiful. These are the words from the Mass for today's feast, Our Lady of Lourdes. When the Most Blessed Virgin Mary appeared in the grotto of Massabiel in France to little Saint Bernadette. She was just a young adolescent girl. She had a terrible case of asthma and she had to go gather wood with her sisters and all the circumstances that brought her to the feet of that shrine, that grotto, which today is lured. So what a very beautiful day to have your marriage vows, that the Virgin Mary herself, her feast on this day, is here to witness your vows and bless your vows and all your children on to the third and fourth generation. So during the Mass, there'll be the two blessings. The priest will interrupt the Mass, turn around on the epistle side, and give the blessing. And it really asks, especially for the, the mother, to imitate the modesty and generosity of Sarah, Rachel, and Rebecca, and that you be fruitful. If God blesses you with children, that you see your children to the fourth and third and fourth generation. And notice it's in the plural, many children. 
God wants large families. Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, how often he repeated this, and in one sermon in 1979, he said, we need, talking to all the traditional Catholics throughout the world, we need the crusade of the large family, the large Catholic family. It is a blessing, it is a school of virtue, it is the school where a boy and girl learn to be generous, self-sacrifice, that they're not the center of the world. They have to learn to uh, bear the burdens, the chores of the house, and the labors pertaining to the maintenance of the house. Wood cutting, lawn cutting, shoveling dirt, dishes, whatever it is. And all this will be blessed by God here today when you, Wyatt and Michelle, make your vows. The Virgin Mary, when she appeared in Lourdes, there's a few points that teach us a lot about marriage, actually. First, all the circumstances that brought Our Lady to the grotto and what brought little St. Bernadette to her feet. It was a lot of different circumstances. St. Bernadette wasn't even supposed to go gather wood because of her bad health. But she did because someone visited her mother and she said, okay, Bernadette, you go with your sisters, gather the wood. And they lived very poor. They lived in a, what used to be a prison house. So the, the house that her father had wasn't even good enough for prisoners. But they made the best what they did, what they could of that poor situation. So St. Bernadette also going down, she couldn't cross the river. She couldn't step into the water, so she stayed on the other side and she, she thought she would gather wood near the grotto. So her other sisters and friends went down the stream. So all these little circumstances that brought St. Bernadette to the grotto, which would shake and change the history of France and the whole world, because what happened there still affects the entire world. It is called by St. Pius X the, the shrine of Our Lady, of her, her place where she's honored. And so St. Bernadette, gathering wood, she sees this, suddenly sees this light and this beautiful young girl. Our Lady was pro probably about 15 or 16 in the apparition. She appears very young and beautiful. And St. Bernadette is instantly caught into ecstasy. And she falls to her knees, and immediately she pulls out her rosary and just instinct instinctively prays. Because Our Lady, the Virgin Mary, is so beautiful that it takes the soul almost out of her body. That's what's called ecstasy. Ex Stare, which means to stand outside of your body. So St. Bernadette, during those times, she would just, her face would be shining and everyone would see her whole demeanor transformed by seeing the Virgin Mary. So one, you've got all the circumstances that God works and, and all the circumstances that brought you two together. It's always the hand of God, his divine providence, his divine wisdom, that makes events happen the way they do. And if men fail because they sin, that doesn't stop God's plan. The fall of Adam threw a huge wrench in the works, but God did something greater. He restored the redemption by himself, becoming man, by dying on the tree of the cross. Adam and Eve lost the tree of paradise, which would keep them young and live forever, immortal. But now that they sinned and disobeyed God, they were driven from that tree of paradise and they would die 930 years later. But God in his goodness, he restores everything and he rewrote the whole history and he would become man and he would give us back the tree of life. And this tree of life has the fruit that when you eat it, it doesn't just help you live healthy and strong and live uh, long on this life. But this fruit of this tree of the cross gives you eternal life who eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall not taste death forever but shall have life everlasting and this is what happens at the mass the tree of the 
the new tree of life is planted by the priest on the, on the altar. And then at Holy Communion time, he plucks the fruit off of that tree and gives it to all those hungry and thirsty for the body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ. That is Holy Communion. And we say that in, every day in our rosary, don't we? Holy Mary, Mother of God, uh, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And we say, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. What is this fruit of this tree? It is Jesus Christ, born and conceived by the power of the, of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So this is what you will eat very soon at Holy Communion where our Lord will, will, as it were, seal your marriage. And when you make your vows very soon, you offer to each other, you give each other to each other, and it's expressed by the exchange of the rings and the words you will say. And you will say to each other, with this ring, I thee wed, and I pledge unto thee my fidelity. You pledge to each other fidelity till the day you die. And when these vows are made, it is witnessed by the best man and maid of honor. It's witnessed by all of you who come, some of you from very far. And God bless you and for coming on this happy occasion. And also it's witnessed by the, our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of heaven and earth, the Blessed Mother, and all the angels and saints. So it's very public, these vows. And these vows are precious, they are good. And the devil will do everything to destroy these vows. He works on priests, he works on nuns, he works on monks to abandon their vows. And he has a field day with divorce. And that, that terrible curse called divorce that, that is so offensive to God. And the words of our Lord say it, no, no judge, no president, no court, no civil court, nor even supreme court can dissolve what takes place here very soon. The, these, these vows will be cemented. You'll be fused like two pieces of metal. You'll be fused into one flesh. And so we learn from the events of Lourdes how God, his divine providence, we have to just trust his divine providence. When you get married, there are three of you get, that get married, Bishop Sheen used to say, it'll be Wyatt, Michelle, and Almighty God. And you step into his world in this sacred marriage, and you don't know what adventures he has for you. You just you have no idea what, I'm sure many married people here today, you would never expect many things that happen in your married life that happened. But they do, and God has bigger plans than we do. So work with God, cooperate with him. He has huge plans for your marriage. And it might be blessed with many joys, it might be blessed with many good, uh, let's just say prosperity, but that's not always the mark of God's blessing. When he sends crosses, that is more his way. Look at the Holy Family, St. Joseph and Our Lady having to flee from the massacre of Herod to Egypt. That's a, that's a trip of up to 400 miles on foot through desert lands with robbers and uh, harsh weather. And then St. Joseph having to find a job in a, in a land where they speak hieroglyphics. It wasn't easy. And then, of course, the Egyptians did not like the Jews at all. So there was that other prejudice against them. So when God gives crosses in your marriage and difficult moments and times maybe even of poverty and you don't know what your next job will be, we have to trust in divine providence. And all of us, we say that every day. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. And none of us asked for the this, this, this disaster in the Catholic Church. None of us asked for the Pope to compromise against the Holy Faith, five Popes actually, since Vatican II. None of us asked for the Pope to do this. None of us asked for the bishops to go modernist and accept doctrines that so offend God. None of us asked for all these compromises even by traditional bishops. 
We did not ask for this. We only ask to be faithful to Catholic tradition, to what our Lord revealed, to the traditional mass, the traditional sacraments that Christ instituted. So if even the Pope tries to change it, we have to ignore him. He has no right to change our Catholic faith. He has no right to change our mass. And that, he, that even goes on the civil level. No president, no Supreme Court has the right to take away from you the right to bear arms, the right to defend your family, the right to have private property, and the right to refuse medicines that know will kill you and are directly involved with infanticide. We have no obligation to accept these things. So you have to be ready on the, even now at the civil level to protect your family and your wife, Wyatt, and to stand up to these unjust laws that are being more and more impressed, oppressed upon us. And they are not pleasing to God, and they come with communism and socialism. It's exactly what Our Lady of Fatima said would happen. So you're in for a rough ride. There's no doubt about it. But it's an exciting ride. And trust in the good God. Don't be one of those couples that say, well, we've had three children, that's enough. Well, what if God wants number eight to be the doctor who brings medicine to sustain life longer for people instead of trying to kill them? <clears throat> what if number 10 is the bishop that will restore Catholic tradition and establish monasteries? What if number 12 will be the athlete to beat uh, Michael Jordan and all his records? You don't know what God has planned, and you don't know what adventures he has in store. But be open to him, and you'll have a happy marriage. You will really have a happy marriage if you cooperate with God and not be one of these unhappy modern families that have maybe one, two children by choice. We know that sometimes God may not give even children. He might not, he might not give one or two or three. And if, you, if that's all he gives, blessed be God. But, but I'm referring to families, parents, who know they could have more children and, and then refuse it. And those, that is very displeasing to God. Remember in the gospel, our Lord passed that, that uh, fruit tree, the fig tree, it wasn't even the season for figs, but he looked for fruit on it, and there was no fruit. And he cursed that fig tree, and right before all the eyes of the apostles, that fig tree just withered to a stick and dry leaves, right before their eyes. Why did Christ curse it? Because there was no fruit on that tree. So in your marriage, our Lord, if he gives you children, he wants to see fruits. That is, many children around your table, smiling like olives, says the scriptures. And also he wants to see even more the good fruits between you and your children. That is what St. Paul says, husbands love your wives, cherish your wives, spend time with them, and you have to put down that phone or put off that computer and give time to your wife. How many marriages have problems because they just never talk? The wife prepares a great supper. Dad comes home. He's off on the computer. And he's not there for supper. And this happens over and over again. That causes immense friction in the family. Don't let these modern gadgets get between you. We know there's a place for them. We know how useful they can be. But they can also be destructive and put wedges between you. Don't let that happen. You have to have times where you just shut off all these gadgets and have time together. And Wyatt, you have to listen to your, to your wife. You might have a headache, you might not feel well, but sometimes you just gotta listen. And that's part of love, that's part of cherishing. And the wives don't always need answers and solutions, but they do need you to listen. The husband and the man must listen. He's the pillar of the home. He has to be the one that takes extra leaning, extra bruises, extra beatings. That's the way it is. And men will be more judged by God strictly and severely than the woman because he is that pillar. So be that pillar for Michelle to lean on, to rest on, to climb on, as it were, to depend on, 
And you can't do it alone either, Wyatt, and nor, nor any father of the family. Fathers need fathers. And we need to turn to the sacred heart of our Lord. He is the father of fathers. And you've got to turn to him. Lord, help me provide for my family. I might lose this job. Help me to find another. And so forth and so forth. So we've got to turn to the sacred heart of Jesus, who promises peace in the home. And you will have that peace if you turn to him. And the father of the family, Arch, uh, Bishop Tissier de Malare used to always say, when the children, especially the boys, see dad leading the rosary, dad leading grace, dad leading the, the prayer for the, the car ride, you'll have priestly vocations and nuns. Because it's the duty of the father to lead the prayers. It's not the mother's first duty. When the father's not there, the mother does it. But it is wrong when the mother gathers the children and she starts the grace when her husband's right there. That is out of place. It's good they want to pray, but we have to keep that order God intended. St. John Chrysostom used to call the father of the family, he's like the priest of the home. He, it is his duty to lead the prayers and to teach the catechism to the children and to tell the Bible stories and make it fun, make it interesting. And many lives of the saints and the martyrs of England, the great uh, Jesuit martyrs in North America, St. Isaac Jogues, St. John de Brebeuf, tell them these great stories of martyrs because we are going into the age of martyrs. The FBI just spouted something about traditional Catholics. So uh, that's a, that's, we laugh about that because what's traditional Catholics but large families, mothers with children, Fathers just trying to support their family. That's what traditional Catholicism is, is about, in saving our soul in, in the reign of Christ the King. So we kind of laugh about these blurps from the FBI because they can search all our homes. They're just going to be fine diapers, fine kitchen, dirty dishes. That's what they're going to find. And it's, we know that's ridiculous. But we know in the history of the church, the, the persecution under Nero... The early Catholics were the most generous people. And they, the pagans used to say, these Catholic people, they're, they're so full of charity. They love one another so much. And it drew many pagans to become Catholic and to be baptized. But Nero, his wife was a Jewess, and she twisted many stories and twisted many accounts and lied. And so Nero unleashed the first of the 10 great persecutions on the Catholic Church. And then during the French Revolution, how many Catholics and priests and nuns were put to death? And also under communism, thousands and thousands of priests, nuns, bishops, and faithful went to death, even millions, millions under Stalin. So God sometimes allows times of persecution on the church, and we're in that right now. We have a pope who's trying to destroy the Tridentine Mass. What do we do? We tell him, like St. Paul said to St. Peter, we resist you to the face. You have no right to destroy what Christ gave us, the true Catholic Mass, his holy sacrifice of the cross reenacted. And not the Novus Ordo nonsense, facing the people and all about the assembly. That's not the Catholic Mass. That's a Protestant service. But the real Mass faces God. The priest says the words that Christ commanded him, and, and then God comes down on the altar, and the burning heart of Jesus is given to you in Holy Communion. So put all in the heart of our Lord, Wyatt, as the father of the family, turn to him, turn to him. In St. Mary's, Kansas, they have all-night adoration. They, there's, the church is never closed. And I used to come back years ago from Mass Circuit, 2 in the morning or midnight, and I would see some good fathers kneeling there before the Blessed Sacrament praying. One father was a father of 16 children, and I saw him praying to our Lord. So may our Lord find you also at his feet often. You're going to need it, Wyatt, in these days. And then, of course, the other virtues between you. God wants to see the good fruits of humility and honoring your husband, Michelle. Your husband might uh, 
you might be able to, to change a tire better than him. You might be able to fix the roof better than him. You might be able to carry more logs than him. That doesn't matter. You give it to him. That's the man's job. There is a distinction of roles. And same with Wyatt. Her, the, the role of the woman is what pertains to the meals, to the kitchen, and the diapers. But of course, of course, it's not a, a, a strict, impassable line. I know many good husbands, they have to, their wife is down, she's got a fever, she's sick. He changes the diapers. He does the dishes. He'll prepare the meals. That's what you have to do. That's part of love. You have to help each other in the burdens. But uh, let, let the wife, however, honor her husband. Give him the manly duties to do. And then, of course, respect him. And in front of the children, never yell at him and degrade him. If you get a fight between you, which may happen, then what do you do? One, the golden rule is don't yell, ever yell at each other. The neighbor should never hear screaming from your house, ever. And no man should ever downgrade or use cuss words on his wife, ever. The golden rule is take it to your bedroom and discuss it calmly. If that's not possible, then you knock horns and the children see you fighting. Then you have an obligation to teach them how to forgive. So let them see you forgive each other and embrace each other and, and a holy kiss between you of peace that puts the children at ease. They need to see that. So if you're not the saints that just calmly discuss in, the, in your own bedroom, and this is not so easy with many couples, and you do explode in front of the children, let them see you forgive each other. This is very important. And then let the children see the love between you. It should be normal when the man comes home, the wife drops everything and gives him a kiss to welcome him home. This is normal. And the children need to see this, this love and affection between you. And your boys will respect that. When your boys get mouthy towards mom and they disobey her, there's one father that said, you will not talk that way to my wife. And that sunk in. He didn't say, you're not going to talk that way to, to your mother. He said, you're not going to talk that way to my wife. And that sunk in to those boys. How dad loves mom, and he will defend her and honor her. And this is all part of the Catholic virtue. And of course, all the virtues you must instill in your children of a holy obedience, of humility, of giving, giving honor to God in their heart when they succeed in things, if they're talented in, in their studies or talented in their sports. Teach them to be humble and give the glory to God and not to seek the glory of themselves. That humility of heart which is important. Teach them hard work and teach your girls to be feminine. Oh, how, how the modern world wants to turn our girls into wrestlers with big muscles and, uh, and cussing like truck drivers and wearing blue jeans and talking and acting and moving and gesturing like a man. No man wants to marry a man if he's sane in his mind. He wants to marry a woman that's feminine. Teach your girls to be feminine, to love the feminine things. They should know how to sew. They should know how to clean a house. They should know how to prepare a meal at a certain age. And they should be free and generous and not forced and constrained. And they should love these things, the feminine things, and try to instill that in your girls. It's hard because the modern world is pushing the girls to be more and more masculine and pushing the boys to be more and more soft and feminine. It is a nightmare. And we know what God thinks of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can go visit there, look up on your internet things, look up the Sodom and Gomorrah by archaeologists. And they go visit there, and it's just cooked to a crisp. There's nothing, not even cockroaches crawl there, not even weeds grow there. It's a lesson to the human race how hateful before God's eyes is this whole Sodom and Gomorrah vice, which is being pushed everywhere now on the children, cartoons, books, movies, music. It's a whole cultural attack 
on the sanctity of marriage and on the sanctity of, of what a man is and of what a woman is. So good luck to you raising children in this upside down world, but you'll have the grace with this marriage today, you'll have the grace to do it and do it right. So may Our Lady provide and protect and give you wisdom and watch over you. And back to the apparitions of Our Lady at, at Lourdes, the Virgin Mary would pray the rosary with her. When St. Bernadette prayed the rosary looking at her, she would say the Hail Marys, but Our Lady wouldn't say the Hail Mary. And she would say, glory be, but she couldn't participate, she couldn't pray the Our Father either because she, she could not say honestly, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us because Our Lady has no sin. So she could just pray the glory, the glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost with St. Bernadette. But she would follow her. So this teaches us a lot how Our Lady insists on the rosary. And she says, pray for poor sinners, pray and do penance, pray and do penance. And as a family, keep the daily rosary. The rosary is your best life insurance. The rosary is your best uh, way to support the family and to have food on the table and pay the bills. The best insurance is the daily rosary. The daily rosary, it's so powerful. And never let, as much as you can, never let a day go by without the daily rosary. And try to pray it well. A little side note, um, don't make it too fast. And I usually don't have to tell people don't to speed it up a bit. That's usually not the case. Uh, but usually it's, you got to slow down a little bit. Some families, they go like 95 miles an hour through the rosary. <laughs> and then, you know, life goes on. And rosary just becomes a rattling session. But we got to be careful of that. Remember what our Lord said. They, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So let the family rosary be truly a, a meditation, a true prayer, a true humble outcry to God and cry to him, begging his help. And I know some good families, for the children, they have, they have an album of pictures of all the mysteries of the rosary so they can see the visible pictures to think about during the rosary. But how powerful is the rosary? And when everything seems, if you hit a state where you seem helpless, you don't know where to turn, you have no job, and you don't know what's going to happen next, pray the rosary. Our Lady takes care of everything in St. Joseph. And then lastly, when the Virgin Mary, she appeared 18 times to St. Bernadette at, at Masabiel, at the Grado. And in one of these apparitions, St. Bernadette was praying and looking at Our Lady, and behind her, she heard all these guttural voices from hell. And the devils were shouting, get out of here, get out of here, to St. Bernadette. And St. Bernadette says that Our Lady, she just nodded, she, she turned her gaze from St. Bernadette and just looked behind her. And all that racket of devils just fled, fled at the sight of the Virgin Mary. So one glance of Our Lady drives the devils away. Just one glance. So pray when we say, turn thine eyes, oh, oh, turn thine eyes of mercy upon us in the Hail Holy Queen prayer. Turn thine eyes of mercy upon us. Turn thy gracious eyes to us. We turn to our Blessed Mother because God has exalted his own mother. So turn to her in any, any, any times of difficulty, she does drive the devil away, and she's very powerful. So let that be pillars for your home, just to be resigned to God's will. Second, pray the rosary and make penance. And of course, raising children is a lot of penance. It's not easy. But St. Paul canonizes the mothers. He says the women shall be saved through childbearing. You will save your soul. You'll become a saint by taking the children God sends and raising them. And then turn to her against the attacks of the devil and the world, the spirit of the world. Watch out for the spirit of the world. Don't have regular TV in your house. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, 
who wrote a, a big, thick book about that thick on the concentration camps under communist Russia. He said, having a TV in your home is like having raw sewage pumped into your living room. Watch over the internet. You're, you're going to need to use it, obviously, for your work and for just daily life, directions and all that. We know that. But you cannot let children under 18 on that by themselves. It's common sense. There's too many dangerous cliffs to run off, if you know what I mean. So you got to monitor these things. Be watchful. And that's part of uh, guarding your house, guarding from the spirit of the world. How many young children at eight or nine are already corrupted, already living in mortal sin? St. John Bosco saw seven and eight and ten-year-olds in hell. And this sister Josefa Menendez, the great mystic that the Sacred Heart appeared to in the 1920s and 30s, she went down into hell and she saw 15-year-old girls there. She saw young kids there because they died in mortal sin. So keep that corruption from them and give them great heroes to look up to, heroes of chastity, heroes of self-sacrifice like St. Isaac Jogues, St. John de Brebeuf, St. Edmund Campion, who went to be hanged, drawn, and quartered in England, and all these heroic saints, St. Saint Tarsicius, who carried the Blessed Sacrament and was beaten to death. Give them these heroes, and to your girls, instill in them a great love of chastity, purity, and holiness, like St. Maria Goretti. She, her mother, they were poor, and they had to work hard. And Alexandro, her, his father was a drunk, he beat him. And Alexandro, at age 17, he tried to force himself on little Maria Goretti, who was only 12. But she, the 12-year-old Italian girls looked 15, you know, 16. So Alexandro pushed himself on her, and she said, Alexandro, God sees us. We, this, sins like this will take us to hell. And Alexandro, furious and anger, angry, full of anger and rage, he took an ice pick about that long, eight inches, and stabbed her through 14 times. These are the heroes that your children need. And before she died, she said, I forgive Alexandro, and I want to see him in heaven with me. So let your children know and love these true heroes. They don't need Superman, Batman, and Transformers. They don't need that, May, you know, for play or whatever. But I'm not condemning it absolutely, but I'm just saying the pre preeminence should be given to the real heroes, the saints and the martyrs. So enough of my talking. And let's turn to the Virgin Mary of Lourdes. What a happy day to make your vows. We ask the Virgin Mary to put her mantle over you and all of you and all Catholic families throughout the world, all these threatening traditional Catholic families that the FBI is all worried about. We ask that Our Lady to spread her mantle over all of you, and especially you, Wyatt and Michelle, on this beautiful day where you make your vows before the throne of God and Our Lady and all the angels and saints and all the witnesses here. May she strengthen you, make your marriage happy, holy, and when you carry the crosses, just we should be happy in times of crosses as well. Our Lady stood at the foot of the cross, draw close to her sorrowful and immaculate heart. She will be your strength. And uh, we ask also the guardian angels, your guardian angels, to watch over you and protect you. So keep the guardian angels busy. Uh, St. Thomas asked the question, when does God give the guardian angel to a baby? Is it at conception? Is it at birth? Or is it at the baptism that the guardian angel is assigned? And St. Thomas Aquinas says, well, it's not, at, it's not at baptism because sometimes the guardian angels have to work extra hard to protect the baby so that the baby gets to the baptismal font to protect it from danger or disease or accidents. So it's not at baptism, nor is it at conception because St. Thomas says, as long as the baby is in the mother's womb, right from the moment of conception, the guardian angel of the mother watches over that baby. And how many guardian angels must 
If they could weep tears, they would fill the oceans with all the horrible abortions. So the guardian angel of the mother looks after the baby to see a happy delivery. So when is the guardian angel assigned? It's at birth, says St. Thomas, at birth. So may, your, may many guardian angels be happy to receive the new assignment of your children. And one last point before I go way too long. Please give your children Catholic names. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of saints. We don't need to have more crystals and Trishas and who knows all these crazy names. And if you're named by those, I don't, I don't mean to offend anybody if you're named Crystal. But give your children Catholic names. There are so many great saints, beautiful saints. So give your children good Catholic names. And those saints that you name them after, look after them from heaven and help them get to heaven. It's very real. The saints are our big brothers and sisters in heaven. They want us in heaven more than we do. So give them saints. When I was doing the Mass, actually from Post Falls, back in the 90s, my mission for 10 months was flying to Hawaii to say Mass there. And one young couple came up and they had the new baby and I said, well, what do you want to name the baby? They said, we want to name him Ocean. And I said, okay, look, we all love the ocean, but you got to give the baby a, a saint's name. So after a little bit of tug of war, they agreed to give Ocean a, a saint's name. So it wasn't named Ocean, thank God. So give your children saint's names, please. I beg you. And uh, so anyway, let's go now to the vows. Right now, Michelle and, and Wyatt will make their vows, and then they'll unite their vows to Jesus crucified on the altar. What a beautiful, what a beautiful foundation of their marriage, founded on the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Greater love than this no man has than to lay down his life, not only for his friends, but his enemies. So may that love of Jesus crucified seal your marriage, and at the end of the Mass, you will kiss the crucifix to show the union of love between the heart of Jesus and the heart of Wyatt and the heart of Michelle. May your hearts burn in the love of God and cooperate with him in the great adventures God has in store for you. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.